All right, welcome to the last week of lecture in dispensationalism, meaning next week we have final exams. As far as your notes, you should have pages 57 and 58, and then also uh, you will have an updated uh, practice test. Now, for those of you in-house, I just printed the last page because that's all that was updated for those that are taking the classes online. There's a new updated PDF. It doesn't say new. It's just practice test, so you'll need to, to download that so that you've got the rest of the questions. There will be no more notes after tonight, so this is it. Uh, next week, you need to make sure you're prepared for the final exam. Of course, uh, those of you that are in, uh, in-house here, uh, you'll need to make sure your notebook is ready to go. Uh, both here and online, you'll need to make sure that you can do your memory work now. It's not going to be verbally done. You're going to have to write it down, okay? And, and I would include punctuation. Try to do your best on punctuation as well. Maybe gracious, but uh, try to make sure you get that. And uh, so just keep those things in mind for, uh, for next week. Now, as far as schedule, next week um, we will start at 6 on the test, okay? Those that are online students, they'll they'll join us online and, and Brother Colvis if you can help me kind of remember this we'll give some initial instructions as far as the test and then we'll cut off the stream and then online students will mail in, email in their test those of you here will you'll take the test and we'll grade the test while we're in here okay so you'll know in-house you'll know what you what your grade was before you leave all right is that exciting yes okay now Previously, when we had dispensationalism in the Bible Institute, it was two terms. And that was seven weeks of class, then a test, then seven weeks of class and a test. So that would be 14 total weeks of lecture. Now, because we're doing the uh, semesters, we have 15 weeks. So we'll probably get done a little bit early on dispensationalism tonight, and then we'll take a few minutes break like we normally do, and then we'll get on into to Hebrews. And we have an expected end on both classes tonight. We can't go beyond that. This is the last of dispensationalism. Next semester, we will start uh, in the place of dispensationalism. We will do the New Testament church. And then we will continue Hebrews. So that will all uh, start back in August. And I just wanted to give you that information. All right, if you'll get to page 57 of your notes. And then if you will turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and then uh, page 57 of your notes. I appreciate you all being with us this semester and I hope that um, you have enjoyed yourself. And of course I say that before the, the final exam just in case everything goes south next week for you. I, I wanted you to know ahead of time I, I hope you enjoyed it. Revelation chapter 20 and then page 57 of your notes and we will go to the Lord in prayer to get started this evening. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. You've been so good to us. I pray that you'd help us as we study the scripture tonight. Help us to learn some things that would be beneficial to us. Lord, we, uh, we're just grateful for, for your faithfulness to us. We're grateful for your mercy. And Lord, we just pray that you would meet with us in a special way tonight. Open our eyes and our minds to be able to understand and comprehend what the Bible teaches. And Lord, give me clarity of mind as I teach, clarity of speech, that I might be able to be a help to your students. And Lord, we'll just be sure to give you the glory for all that you do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, we've been talking the, uh, the, the past couple of weeks about the dispensation, uh, not necessarily the dispensation, but about Daniel's 70th week. So we, if, you, uh, if you look back to page... Let me get you back to one of these charts just to, to be a help here. Uh, go back to page 52 of your notes. No, no, go to page 54 of your notes. This is where we'll, we'll look. Page 54 of your notes. Uh, we talked a few weeks back about the church age, and we talked about the last event for the church age, and that is the rapture of the church, the catching away, uh, whatever you want to call it. But uh, we've, we talked about that'll be the last event of the church age. And of course, the church is going to go up to be with the Lord Jesus. Do you remember what that's called when we go up to be with the Lord and we're in the air with Him and, and it starts uh, uh, the judgment seat? You remember what that's called? The, the day of what? 
up in heaven. No, okay, that's the event that leads to it, but up in heaven, what? No, nope, not the day of the Lord. Day of, the day of Christ, okay? That's the judgment seat. That's when rewards are handed out. That's taking place in heaven. Now, while that's going on in heaven, on the earth is an event called Daniel's 70th week. Uh, you frequently hear it called the tribulation or Jacob's trouble. Those are some terms that you'll hear from time to time. Uh, but Daniel's 70th week takes place on the earth. You remember Daniel's 70th week is a seven-year period of time. It's broken up into two halves. In the middle of, the, of Daniel's 70th week, the, uh, the man of sin is revealed, and Satan, uh, the, you got the Michael uh, casting Satan out to the earth, and, and all sorts of things began to, to go wrong for Israel at that time period. Now, at the end of Daniel's 70th week, you have the second coming. That's different. The event before the day of Christ is the blessed hope. That was what uh, Brother Walker just mentioned a moment ago. That's for the church, and the, and the church goes up to be with the Lord, but then Revelation chapter 19 says we're going to come back with the Lord on white horses. We're going to be his, uh, part of his armies in heaven. And somewhere right before the, the second coming starts the day of the Lord. Now, the Bible says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And it seems to indicate that the day of the Lord in the context is a period of time that lasts pretty much right at a thousand years. And so that means if the day of the Lord starts, uh, if the day of the Lord includes the millennium, the kingdom, which, which it does, because the Bible says it goes until the, the new heaven and the new earth, then it's got to start somewhere pretty close to right before the, the Lord's second coming. And so we've talked about all these things, and at the second coming you have the Lord, uh, of course he's coming in war, coming in battle, Revelation chapter 19, and he goes into what's called the judgment of the nations. He judges the nation of Israel and he judges the nations. Matthew chapter 25 talks about the judgment of the nations. And, and these things I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm not reading from notes. I'm trying to give you, uh, you know, the, the background and bring you up to speed. I'm not trying to, you know, give you something I'm going to trip you up with on the, on the test necessarily. I'm just trying to bring you up to where we are now. So you've got the second coming, and there, there's the judgment of the nations. Many of you have read the passage or heard messages preached about, uh, if you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And the Lord says, I was uh, in prison, and you visited me. I was uh, naked, and you clothed me. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. All those things. And he's talking to these nations about the way they dealt with the nation of Israel during Daniel's 70th week. And if they helped the nation of Israel and they were a blessing to the nation of Israel, then they had opportunity to enter into the kingdom. So after the second coming, if you look at that chart on page 54, and you see that arrow coming down there to your right, day of the Lord on earth, the, you see millennium there kind of uh, diagonal uh, written on that chart on page 54 is where we are, page 54, that you see millennium there. When, we, when you see the word millennium, that's the kingdom. And that millennium means a thousand year period of time. It's a thousand years. And so after the Lord's second coming, he, he judges the nation. Some nations go into the kingdom. Other nations are destroyed. And now we enter into the kingdom. And so that's where we are tonight uh, on page 57 of our notes. We're talking about the dispensation of the kingdom. Now remember this is something that was preached during the earthly ministry of the Lord. Uh, they, they said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were preaching about the kingdom back then, uh, even uh, uh, early on in the apostolic age. Remember, the, the Jews were saying, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. And, um, and so he says, go and wait for the promise of the Father, which would come, which was the Holy Ghost. Now, the beginning of this event, here again, this is not meant to be like a, you know, a dogmatic, this, once this happens, you're, you've entered into it, but kind of the, the bookmark events, if you will, the second coming of Christ, which we just talked about, and the judgments that follow. Now, that's not the great white throne judgment, okay? The judgment of Israel, the judgment of the nations would take place then, but we're not talking about the great white throne judgment. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then in the end of it, now this is, uh, if you're somewhat new to this, this is going to sound really odd, okay? Because 
you're going to try to get your mind grasped around or wrapped around all these different concepts, and it's going to be a struggle. And still, some of the things, every once in a while, I'll catch myself saying something, and I'll think, wait a minute, is that, do I have that in the right time period? And I, and I have to stop and, and think about it. Sometimes, if you're saying it off the cuff, you'll, you'll, you'll make some mistakes. It happens to me. It's going to happen to you. It's, it's okay. But at the end of the kingdom, now this may throw you for a little bit here, but I think you'll understand in just a little while. At the end of the kingdom, Satan is going to be loosed out of the, the bottomless pit and he's going to gather together an army of people. And you say, well, how? So I, here's what I've heard some people say. Well, that, you know, that makes me nervous. I mean, what if, what if I'm, what if I do something wrong and I go, you know, and I'm in his army at the end of the thing? It, that's not, it's not you, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully bring some of those things to our understanding tonight. But at the end of the kingdom, Satan is loosed. He's going to be bound during the kingdom for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. He's going to be in prison, if you will, not in the lake of fire, in the bottomless pit. And at the end of the thousand, year, he's, a thousand years, he's loosed, and he gathers together an army to fight against the Lord. It's not much of a battle, uh, but he does gather an army. Now, look with me, if you will, Revelation chapter 20. In verse number 1. Now, Revelation 19, verse number 11. Remember we said that's the, uh, the second coming. That's when those things take place. And you can read about that, uh, verse number 11, down through the end of the chapter. Now, Revelation chapter 20, verse number 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, uh, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the, uh, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till, now you gotta get that, because if that verse ended right there, you could, you could have a little bit of a problem. But he said, till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. All right? And I know some of these things are gonna be hard for you to visualize, but you, you find here in Revelation chapter 20 that that's kind of the, the beginning talk of the kingdom as it pertains to the book of Revelation. Now go down to verse number, uh, verse number 10. The Bible says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, so, so there's two different things going on. At the start of the kingdom, the devil's going to be bound for how long? 1,000 years. At the end of the kingdom, he rises up and he gathers together his army. It's not much of a fight at all. We'll hopefully read that tonight. And then the Bible says he's cast into the lake of fire where he will be for how long? Forever and ever. Okay. So, so if, you, if, you don't, if you don't, here's the beauty of, of dispensationalism and rightly dividing the word of truth. If I don't grasp that one event is at the beginning of the kingdom and the other event is, at, you know, once the kingdom is, is, you know, done and now he's tried to start a war and now he's judged, if I don't do that, I'll start thinking, wait a minute, there's a contradiction here. Why does this say he's bound, he's bound for a thousand years? This says he's cast in the lake of fire forever and ever. There's, there's a contradiction, but there's not a contradiction, okay? You're talking about... The second coming, Jesus comes down, he sets up his kingdom, the devil's bound for a thousand years. That is going to be a, a glorious time. Even more glorious than that, after the devil tries to gather his army there at his last stand, and he's cast into the lake of fire, the Bible says that's forever and ever. So this is, he's going to be tormented there day and night, forever and ever. Some people will tell you that in the lake of fire or in hell, you just cease to be. Okay, but I want to show you this. I want to show you this because I think it's important. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone uh, where the, the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That doesn't sound like just something ceases to be. That sounds like this thing's going to, okay, there's, a, there's day, there's night, there's day, there's, you see what I'm saying? Forever. Now, how would you enjoy life if there's day and night, and every one of them's the same, day and night, then day and night, and it's all in the lake of fire. That's, that's what the devil has coming. So praise God, at the end of this thing, God's going to have the ultimate victory, and we're, we're grateful for that. Okay? Now, 
Um, there are other passages, and we'll show you some, not all of them. A, a lot of the Old Testament prophets speak a great deal about the kingdom. A lot of the Psalms speak a great deal about the kingdom, and you'll see some of those things as you study your scripture. Uh, now, Revelation chapter 20, verse number 2, I, I just want to show you this constant thought here. At the end of verse number 2, it says, And bound him a thousand years. Look at verse number three, and cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years. You see that phrase again, thousand years? Uh, look at verse number four. The Bible says, and I saw thrones, and they that, they, they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither had his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? A thousand years. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So you've got, once again, a thousand years. And we learned that there is going to be another resurrection at the end of the kingdom. Okay, so you're going, to have a, uh, you're going to have some that are going to go into the kingdom. But then at the end, he said, the rest of the dead didn't live until after that. So what, what is the rest of the dead? Well, that would be unsaved Dead, uh, unsaved dead that need to be brought up for the, for the great white throne judgment. So they don't go to hell? They're no, no, they are in hell, which is a holding place. See, for, for years, I'd always heard and preached that hell was the final, eternal resting place of those that have rejected Jesus Christ. But that's really not true, okay? Roman Catholicism teaches there's a holding place, and they call it purgatory. But that's not true. There is a holding place, but it's called hell. But then the Bible says at the end that hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire. So it, it does seem to be a, a two different places. Okay? And so it, at, the end of the, at the end of the kingdom, you're going to have a great white throne judgment. Those dead are going to be raised, brought to judgment, and then cast into the lake of fire. Does that make sense? There is fire, yes, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it is certainly fire in hell. Uh, Luke 16 is all you need to prove that. But it's not the same place as the lake of fire because the Bible, the Bible defines them, says hell is eventually going to be cast into the lake of fire. It's, it's, it's kind of... No, it's fine. Okay, when, 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 I, when you say different degrees of hell... I'm assuming you mean different degrees of punishment and judgment. In hell. Yeah. In hell. Okay. So you're not necessarily suggesting there's a first hell, second hell, third hell, or anything like that. Is that am I correct in that? I don't know. I'm asking you. Okay. There there are varying levels of judgment within hell, but I have read nothing that leads me to believe that there's multiple hells. Okay. Okay. That uh, because the Bible talks about stripes. He that did this is worthy of this many stripes, and he that did this is worthy of more stripes. And so the Bible indicates greater damnation and greater condemnation and, and so varying degrees. If you're all burning. Well, well, we'll have to ask the Lord that. Um, by faith, I believe that there are degrees of punishment. Uh, by faith, I believe that, that hell has fire because the, the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, tormented in the flames. There was a great gulf. So everything that we have indications of in hell is that it's, there's fire and there's judgment. At the same time, it does seem to, to be that according to the scriptures that some folks are going to suffer more severely. Okay, let's look at it from the opposite perspective. If we're all going to be in heaven, the same place, how could some be rewarded more than others? Now, that we can fathom a little bit more, right? We can say, oh, well, you know, maybe it's, I mean, some people say, well, maybe it's a bigger mansion. I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but, okay, maybe there's more crowns. We've got all these things figured out in our minds as far as that goes, but when we talk about hell, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out. Maybe the, I, I'm, just throw, I'm just throwing this out, okay? Don't, don't anybody walk away from here and say, well, well Pastor Ray says, uh, maybe the, the degrees of, of the, the flames, I mean, maybe the, I don't know. The lake of fire, it seems to me like it's a lake. Maybe it's deeper. I mean, who knows? Only God knows. And thankfully, we won't figure that out, right? Does that make sense, though? I know that doesn't answer your question. 
And you know what's going to happen at the end of the night tonight? I'm going to leave you with a lot of questions. Because the very last thing I'm going to say tonight, you're going to say, well, how's that? And I'm going to say, I don't know. Isn't, isn't that fun? <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff in the Bible when we start thinking about eternity that we don't grasp. Okay? Really where the Bible leaves us talking about is the kingdom, and then we go into, okay, what all is heaven about? You know, the vast majority of people that talk about heaven, they're actually talking about the kingdom. Or they're talking about the new Jerusalem. So I'm, I'm just telling you, there's a lot of things we talk about. You know, so shall we ever be with the Lord. I know that. I know the Bible teaches that. So wherever the Lord is, I'm going to be there. But a lot of the things we pick up from our culture and we run with, we're not really talking about what we think we're talking about. Yes. Have, you Have I given thought to how that's going to be? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, when the angels left their first estate and mixed with the women. Right. Nothing like that's going to happen right on, on the earth. Yeah, like remember Grandma glorified body, but there's going to be great rebellion again. There will be, but it'll be all from the, those with natural bodies. Um, because the, the way the Bible words, even those people entering the kingdom, um, the nations, the way he words their, their um, benefits to entering the kingdom, it cannot be those people who rebel. The, way, the, the, the promise that the Lord gives at the end of the judgment of the nations, and he says, enter into the joy of the Lord, and he's talking to them about eternal life that they've got going into the kingdom. So it can't be them if it's them then we got, we got problems with eternal life today because the promises he makes to them entering into the kingdom are similar promises he's made to us about our eternal life. So it has to be a different group of people, which we're going to get to that. Who, who could it be that rebels at the end of the kingdom? And, uh, but it's, but it's, not, it's not the saints of this age. It's, it's not, if it is... And this is why this stuff's so important. I know this is out there for some of you. I mean, you know, some people, they love science fiction stuff, and, and they say the Bible's boring, but they really only because they've not stopped to try to figure some of this stuff out. The Bible is very complicated when it comes to this stuff. Uh, I mean, you're asking questions that the, I mean, how many, what percentage of Christians actually think about, well, how is it going to mix between glorified and natural bodies in, you know, in the millennium? The vast majority of people, when you say that, they say, what do you mean? Okay. We're going we're gonna to talk about those things. As a matter of fact, that's in our notes tonight to talk about who enters with glorified bodies, who enters with natural bodies. And we're going to try to dis decipher at the end of the kingdom what people group is it that joins the armies of Satan ready to fight. And then, of course, they get destroyed pretty quickly. Now, uh, look with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And uh, look at verse number 6, Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. The kingdom, when, uh, when the Lord comes and he sets up his earthly kingdom, that earthly kingdom is going to be in fulfillment to promises that God has been making to the nation of Israel for thousands of years. And some of the, you know, people say, well, uh, God's turned his back on Israel. That's not true. Romans chapter 11, I believe it is, teaches us that God has not forsaken Israel and he's going to turn back to Israel and he's going to deal with Israel and he's going to keep his promises to them. If God promised them a, a, a king, he's going to give them a king. If God promised them a kingdom, he's going to give them a kingdom. God is going to fulfill his promises to them and we cannot, hear me out on this, we cannot spiritualize those promises and then apply them to the church and suggest that, that that's what God intended because it is not at all what God intended. God made literal promises to the nation of Israel and he is going to keep those. Isaiah chapter 9 verse number 6, you know this passage well and oftentimes we associate it with the incarnation of Christ but that's not the end of the story. Verse number 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Okay, you say, well, there it is. There's the incarnation. I agree. But the next part's not the incarnation. 
The next part is not the birth of Christ. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That, so you have, uh, hopefully you can understand why you had Jews there during the earthly ministry that, okay, they find out this is the Messiah and they're ready to put a crown on him. Why would they be ready to crown him king when you and I know that he came to die on the cross? Why would they be, uh, as a matter of fact, he said at one point, he knew that he perceived that they, were gonna, they wanted to make him king, so he disappeared out of their sight. He, he moves on out the crowd and, and so that they can't see him. Why? because they want to put a crown on him. It's not time for the crown, but you can see why they thought that because they read these prophecies in Isaiah chapter nine, verse number six, and it goes straight from him being a child, being a son, to ruling. So Simon Peter pulls the sword out and cuts a man's ear off because he thinks it's time. They didn't get that there's a pause. Now look, I want you to, I want you to look at this because this is gonna to happen to you several times in your Bible. And the more you learn, the more you read, you're going to see this more often. When you're first starting into the Bible, you don't, you don't catch it. Look after the word given in verse number six. Does everybody see the word given and then what, what's after given? Okay, a colon. Now, as of right now, this is, I mean, at, at the least, you're looking at over 2,000 years space of time designated by that one colon. But it's all in the same verse. But that colon in verse number six signifies at least a 2,000 period, a 2,000 year period of time. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So you can see why they're reading it, they're thinking one event, but that colon is, okay, here's a 2,000 year gap right here, okay? You have a question? Is there another gap after the word shoulder? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, uh, because it seems like the government should be upon his shoulder. Then verse number seven of the increase of his government, you're still talking about his government, and that is him being the king. So the only way you know that is because you're looking at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. If you were standing there in the Old Testament reading that, you're going to think it's all together. Um, let me give you another thing here. Go to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61. This is not in your notes, but I, if I can remember all the verses, I think this would be a good thing for you to, for you to see. All right. So... I, what I want you to do, I want you to get two places in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 61 is going to be one place, and then Luke chapter 4 would be the other. And here's what we'll do. I'll have you all looking at uh, Luke chapter 4. Okay, that's where I'll have you focused. You're going to start in verse number 18. So Luke 4, 18. Now, what you're finding in Luke 4, 18, the Lord Jesus goes into the temple and they hand him the, 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 uh, the book of Isaiah, basically, but they hand him a scroll of Isaiah to read. He's going to do scripture reading. You know how here in the church, we'll have Brother Morris come up to the front and he'll read scripture. Uh, so a time of scripture reading is basically what you have. So you're going to be in verse 18, Luke 4, 18, okay? See if you can follow along with me. I'm in Isaiah 61 in verse number one. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance to our God, to comfort, uh, all, uh, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, did you have all that? Okay, what's the last thing you had? To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Year of the Lord. Okay, now what did, he, what did he do? Then he closed the book. 
So what the Lord's letting us see here, so he reads down to a certain point, he closes the book. It doesn't mean that there was nothing else to read. It means he stopped where he needed to stop. You say, why would he do that? Look at verse number 20 of your passage. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the, to the minister and sat down and, all, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture. So to the point where he read, you see what I'm saying? He, so if he'd have kept reading, all these other things that Isaiah actually spoke of, would have, he, he was saying this day, this scripture, what I just read to you, so he stops strategically, closes the book, and says, I'm not ready to do the last part of this. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So even in Isaiah chapter 61, you've got some that he fulfilled in his first coming, and then some that he's going to fulfill when he comes to set up his kingdom. So I hope that makes some sense to you. Now go with me, if you will, to, to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31 uh, at some point on down the road next semester, we'll also come to this study in the book of Hebrews, and we'll deal with it more then. Uh, there is something that the Bible calls the new covenant. Now, spiritually speaking, we get some of the benefits of the new covenant. Um, forgiveness of sins. God saying he would remember our sins no more. And people, you know, uh, talk about that quite a bit, but it's actually part of the new covenant. But we get some of those benefits being saved in the age of grace, or in the church age, I should say. But look with me to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse number 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now, what covenant is that? What covenant did the Lord make with Israel when he took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt? The Mosaic covenant, the law, okay? So he said, I'm going to make a new covenant, but it's not going to be according to the one that I made with them in that day. He said, which, uh, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. So he says he's going to put his law inside of them. It's not going to be written on tables of stone. He says he's going to write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now you can read about that in the book of Hebrews as well, and we will in the, in the coming weeks as we study that subject matter. But the Lord promised them a king. He promised them a kingdom. We'll not go to Daniel 2 right now, but he promised them a kingdom that would come. Uh, and then he promised them a covenant. And God's going to fulfill all that in the, uh, in the millennium. Now, go with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 19. Uh, that'll be when we're doing Hebrews. Second, that'll be second semester of Hebrews. That we're going to look at. The, we're talking, is that right? August. Is that about six months? Coming weeks. See my time period? You like that? August or September? We're going to Revelation chapter 19. Not in the coming weeks. We're going there right now. Re Revelation chapter 19, verse number 11. I appreciate you saying that because I'm just, you know, I'm just seeing it that a, a different way. Revelation 19, verse number 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, you, you, well, verse 14, The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, who's going to be in the kingdom, all right? There are going to be saints who return with Christ. Now, that would include Old Testament saints. That would include the church age saints. That would include the 144,000. So when you read about the armies which were in heaven, and maybe that's the reason why he doesn't just say army. Maybe he's denoting some differences there. Uh, but all those uh, that, that I've mentioned are going to come back with the Lord, and it would appear... Uh, that they would all uh, return with glorified bodies. 
Okay, there's no reason to believe that they will not have uh, glorified bodies. You uh, know, of course, when the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead, he took those Old Testament saints with him. Uh, you know that from that point on, those that died, their bodies went to sleep in the ground. Of course, the spirit and soul uh, went to God, those that are saved. And at the blessed hope or the rapture of the church, those bodies are going to be raised and going to be changed. And the Bible says uh, we're going to be given a body like unto his body. And so they're going to be glorified bodies. Now, you'll have resurrected tribulation saints. We just uh, read in Revelation chapter 20 a moment ago, uh, verse number 4, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So they're going to go into the kingdom, and... Uh, it would seem as though since they're going to be resurrected that they also would have glorified bodies. You say, well, why would that be? Well, if they have natural bodies that have been resurrected, you know, their, their bodies would have likely given, to, given over to corruption. So it makes sense that they would also have glorified bodies. Maybe that's not the case, but it would seem that way, certainly. Uh, also, there are going to be surviving tribulation saints, some who endure to the end. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 talks about they endure to the end. There's no reason to believe that their bodies are changed. We have no Bible verse that suggests that they're going to experience the change that we experience at the rapture of the church, which would seem to indicate that they go into the kingdom with natural bodies. And then uh, go to Matthew chapter 25, because this one's not as well known, I don't guess. Matthew chapter 25, and look at verse number 31. The Bible says, uh, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world, and he tells them why. It's because of their treatment of Israel. They say, verse 37, when did we do these things? Verse 40, it says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Uh, then shall he say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So at the judgment of the nations, the Lord's going to divide them out, some on his right hand, some on his left. Those that treated Israel properly, he says, you're going to enter into the kingdom. Okay? Here again, they're going to enter into the kingdom in natural bodies, meaning they're not going to have glorified bodies like the Lord. Uh, they'll enter in in natural bodies like uh, those of the, the surviving tribulation saints. Now, go, go with me, if you will. Let's see if we can get a little bit more accomplished before we break tonight. Revelation. One more question. Yes. I have, and let's see if I can pull, uh, go back to Matthew chapter 25, okay? And let me see if I can pull the corresponding passage. I have struggled with that very subject because of some of the wording, and I want to make sure I uh, show you the struggle, okay? Because if you just read Matthew chapter 25, uh, let's see, let me get the wording here. Matthew 25, verse number 30, uh, verse number 34 he says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, when you just read that, you're just thinking, Okay, they're, they're entering the kingdom, but there's nothing else involved. Let me see if I can find the cross-reference for you uh, here quickly, because that is a, uh, it's a good question. It's one I've struggled with uh, quite a bit. Uh, let's see. I believe if I can find this. Let's see. Go to, I don't think that's the one. I may have to get that for you during break if I can't find it right here real quick, brother. Uh, let me get that at break, okay, because I'm not finding the passage I'm looking for, and, and I don't want to. Let's do this. Go ahead and take a break now. We'll uh, take about 10 minutes. We'll come back, and that way I can go ahead and find this um, and give you that information.